Hello and welcome to Lie Algebras. In this lecture, lecture number 18, we will talk about Weil's theorem on complete reducibility. To formulate theorem, let us first describe the setup. We work with a semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebra G and consider a finite dimensional G module V. Recall that the module V is called simple if it is non-zero and the only submodules of V are the zero submodule and the module V itself. Furthermore, we call V a semi-simple module if it is isomorphic to a direct sum of simple modules. An equivalent condition, a module V is semi-simple if and only if any submodule of V has a complement in V. So now we can formulate the theorem, complete reducibility theorem due to Weil. Every finite dimensional module over a semi-simple finite dimensional complex Lie algebra is semi-simple. We note that the statement of the theorem does not extend to infinite dimensional modules. Before giving a proof, we describe some general but a little bit advanced reasons for why this result is true. First of all, one can show that non-isomorphic simple finite dimensional G modules have different central characters. This can be shown using the theory of highest weight G modules. This means that the center of the universal enveloping algebra of G acts on non-isomorphic simple finite dimensional G modules in a different way. And so you cannot glue non-isomorphic simple finite dimensional modules together to form an indecomposable module because the action of the center splits them. An easy fact is that any G module of dimension two is completely reducible. The reason for that is that if we have a G module of dimension two, which is not simple, then it must have a one dimensional submodule and a one dimensional quotient. The only one dimensional G module is the trivial G module. And since G kills the trivial G module, by choosing a basis in V, such that each element of G is represented by an upper triangular matrix, we can take into account that both simple subquotients are killed by G, and so we must have zeros on the diagonal. So this means that the image of G should be contained in the one dimensional space of upper triangular two times two matrices. However, there are no semi-simple complex Lie algebras which have dimension one, and therefore the image of G must be zero. Now, using easy fact two, one can show the following, that if V is a simple finite dimensional G module, then any short exact sequence where V appears both as a submodule and a quotient splits. Easy fact two, makes this claim for the trivial module V. And using tensoring with V and its dual, one can show that the same claim holds for any simple finite dimensional G module. So combining the fact one, which says that you cannot glue together non-isomorphic simple modules, and the fact three, which says that you cannot glue together a simple module with itself, it follows that any finite dimensional G module is semi-simple, which is exactly the statement of Weil's theorem. Okay, let us now discuss the proof. We will prove this statement in three steps. Step number one is the following claim that any short exact sequence of finite dimensional G modules where the left term is simple and the right term is trivial splits. If the left term of such sequence is the trivial module, we already discussed this on the previous slide. If the left term is a non-trivial module, then we can use the properties of the Casimir element C of the universal enveloping algebra, which we considered in the previous lecture. From the previous lecture, we know that C acts on the trivial module as zero and on any non-trivial simple module as a non-zero scalar. So we even know that the scalar is a positive real number. But the main thing is that it is non-zero. Therefore, the kernel of C acting on the module N is one-dimensional and is isomorphic as a G module to K. 
and therefore this kernel splits this short exact sequence. So this proves step one. Step two is a claim that any short exact sequence of finite dimensional G modules where the right term is trivial splits. So the difference with claim one is that we no longer assume that the left term is a simple module. So here we now consider the case where the left term can be arbitrary. So we do induction on the lengths of this left term. The basis of the induction is a case when the left term is simple, and this is covered by claim one. To do the induction step, assume that we have a submodule M prime of the left term M, such that the quotient M over M prime is simple. Then we can consider the short exact sequence zero goes to M modulo M prime, this goes to N modulo M prime, this goes to K, this goes to zero. So this is a short exact sequence of finite dimensional G modules, where the left term is simple and the right term is trivial. By claim one, the sequence splits. So in particular, we can write N modulo M prime as a direct sum of M modulo M prime plus K. Denote by K prime, the submodule of N, which contains M prime, and such that the quotient of K prime modulo M prime gives exactly the direct sum on K in the above decomposition. Note that the quotient of K prime by M prime is a trivial module. Therefore, we can use the inductive assumption to deduce that K prime decomposes as a direct sum of M prime plus K. So we can denote by Q the trivial submodule of K prime, which gives us the direct sum on K in this decomposition. Note that the submodule Q avoids both M prime from this decomposition, but also it avoids M because of this decomposition. In other words, we can write the whole module N as a direct sum of M and Q. This provides the splitting for our short exact sequence and proves claim two. So now we do the final step, which is the general case. We claim that any exact sequence of finite dimensional G modules splits. Of course, if M or K are zero, then there is nothing to prove. So we assume that both M and K are non-zero G modules. Consider the vector space of all linear maps from N to M, from the middle term of this short exact sequence to the right term. So we can view this linear space as a G module via the action defined as follows. If you have an element G in G and the linear map phi from N to M, then G applied to phi and evaluated at an element V of our vector space N is equal to, by definition, G applied to phi of V so here we use the G module structure on M minus phi applied to the element G of V. So here we use the G module structure on M. So using the fact that both N and M are G modules, it is easy to see that this formula defines on V the structure of a G module. Consider two subspaces of V. The subspace X, which consists of all phi whose restriction to M is zero. So V is a space of all linear maps from N to M, and M is a subspace of N, so it makes sense to restrict elements of V to N. Also define Y as a set of all linear maps phi from V, such that the restriction of phi to M is a scalar multiple of the identity on M. It is easy to check, that both X and Y are submodules of V. And by definition, X is a submodule of Y. By construction, the dimension of the quotient space Y divided by X is one. So this is because the difference in definitions of X and Y is a scalar multiple. So the quotient space will have dimension one corresponding to the choice of the scalar multiple. In particular, Y, modulo x is a one-dimensional G module, which means that this is a trivial G module. By claim two, we know that we can write y as a direct sum of x 
and a trivial G submodule, which we denote by Y prime. So now consider an arbitrary non-zero element alpha in Y prime. Since Y prime is a trivial G module, this alpha has the property that each element of G kills it. And now take a look at the definition of the action of G. So the fact that G of alpha is zero means that G applied to alpha of V is equal to alpha applied to G of V, which means that this element alpha is actually a G homomorphism from N to M. So M is a submodule of N, and we have just constructed a G homomorphism from N to M, which is a non-zero map. So this G homomorphism splits the original short exact sequence, and we can define the complement of M as the kernel of this map alpha. This completes our proof of Weyl's theorem on complete reducibility of finite dimensional modules over semi-simple complex Lie algebras. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed the lecture.